All right, so very timely. Obviously, as I spoke in the beginning about um, looking at different models and different credentials, and obviously Heather's talk touched on a bunch of things about uh, different types of credentials and models that are formulating. So I'm very excited to have this next panel join us on alternative credentials and talking about how they fit into and complement, in some ways compete, but, or, but mostly complement uh, degrees. And so I'm excited to welcome uh, three great panelists. Um, Katie Hall from Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, Jeremiah Shiflet, Shiflet from Lord Fairfax Community College and their higher portal, and Stephanie Krauss from Jobs for the Future. So welcome to them. Thank you. Okay, mic's on. Good to go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Katie. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, and I'm excited to be here at the Sailor Summit. Uh, happy to get to know all of you. I know many faces in the room from the work I'm about to tell you about, um, and I have two great panelists today, uh, Jeremiah and Stephanie. And we're going to share um, some innovations that are underway at each of our respective organizations and just a general perspective on the theme uh, for the conference that we're at um, this afternoon. Um, I think just to start off, it's relevant to note that the mission of Sailor Academy is open education to all. Um, the theme for this event is looking at the degree and beyond, lowering cost, increasing access, and exploring alternatives. And the guiding principle of connecting credentials, which is the project I'll use to sort of set the stage for the panel, um, is that all learning counts. All learning should count no matter where it's acquired. Um, and that's really the guiding principle of our work. And so <laughs> I think those three fit together nicely. Um, and I hope that you all will find uh, this discussion interesting today. We, I think, have until about 4.30. So we will save some time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to think about questions and write those down as we go. Um, it's also worth noting that we had uh, Mike Adams scheduled to be on this panel as well. I think he's in some of your materials. Some of you know Mission U. Um, and he was not able to attend. So... Um, these are the three, and, and that's why you don't see Mike up here today. You're just stuck with us. That's right. We'll just fill the time. Um, so I will let uh, Stephanie and Jeremiah introduce themselves in a little more depth when they talk about the work that they're doing, and you can, of course, read their bios in your program. Um, I'm here representing Connecting Credentials, which is a Lumina Foundation-funded national campaign to transform credentialing in the United States. Um, and there is also a tool, the Beta Credentials Framework, that's associated with the project. Uh, so I direct communications for Connecting Credentials, and so I'm very hands-on with the campaign part of the work, uh, which includes convening work groups around various topic areas, um, collecting co-sponsors to help us host events, to help publish thought leadership in credentialing, um, webinars, maintaining the website, social media, crafting messaging for the nationwide platform. Um, and I am the communications director for the nonprofit Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, which is the lead grantee um, deploying the work. So Connecting Credentials, as I mentioned, is Lumina Foundation funded. It's a collaborative 116 now co-sponsoring organizations who have signed on and basically said, we agree that the credentialing system in the United States is chaotic. Uh, it needs to be better organized. Learners don't know which credentials are valuable and which, will, which ones will get them a job. Um, in education, some are more valuable than others. As we know, the bachelor's degree is still often the proxy, the cutoff for hiring. Um, and employers don't know which credentials are valuable. They don't know what a credential means someone knows and can do. And so that's really the problem that we're attempting to solve. Um, some co-sponsors are in the room today. Uh, University of Maryland University College is a co-sponsor. There are several others, um, so we're always happy to see them at events. In addition to the co-sponsors, there are about 3,500 stakeholders from all over the country uh, that are part of a mailing list that participate in events, work groups, um, add to the thought leadership. And so we're, we're growing. Um, we're picking up a lot of energy through the website, sharing of resources. Um, I encourage you to visit it. It will appear later in the slideshow. Um, and as I mentioned, there is a tool that's also part of Connecting Credentials, and I'll talk very briefly about that later. Um, here's the problem statement that I just mentioned. Why is Lumina funding this work? Why does the initiative exist in the first place? And why does Corporation for a Skilled Workforce care about running an initiative like this? Um, so you can read the problem statement for yourself. I described it a couple minutes ago. Um, and one of our primary objectives is that the system is working better for some people than for others, right? So vulnerable populations who traditionally don't have as much access, don't have as many opportunities to high quality higher education and credentials, they're the ones that are hurt the most 
by the messiness in the credentialing system in the US. So this is not only an economic imperative, helping better connect people to jobs, but it's an equity imperative. Uh, this just is a visual that we use all the time that gives you a snapshot of sort of the messiness in the credentialing landscape. Many different kinds of credentials. Degrees are credentials, industry certifications, certificates, credit and non-credit, uh, badges. Uh, and so they're offered by many different types of organizations. Um, so navigating different types of credentials and what they all mean can be very confusing, very complex. Uh, this is just an evolution of the project that I think is helpful. I always like to point out that in 2013 when the work began, Lumina Foundation tasked us with creating a framework that would organize all credentials that were sub-degree. Uh, they already had the degree qualifications profile, which listed competencies for associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degrees. And so they were looking to supplement that with something that would organize everything else. What we quickly discovered in researching a framework like this was that sub-degree is not necessarily the right terminology. There are some credentials that are higher level uh, than degrees. IT, for example, would map out at a way higher level than an associate's degree in some cases. And so sub-degree wasn't accurate. And we began building our framework as sort of the meta framework on competencies only, not leveled by credentials, but by competency statements of what someone knows and can do. And I, so I think that's an interesting evolution um, and an insight into Lumina Foundation as well. In 15 and 16, we moved into a dialogue around credentialing reform in the US uh, and have begun beta testing the tool with 25 community colleges around the country and employers, HR departments. And now in 2017 and 2018, we're very much moving from dialogue into action full on deploying the campaign, convening work groups, publishing thought leadership, presenting at events. So that's sort of the evolution of the work so far. Um, these are just the buckets of work, the credentials framework. The tool is down here in the bottom. Campaign activities that I mentioned um, in one block. Work groups, which have been a primary uh, piece of the work, convened several hundred experts around the country in work groups. Stephanie Krauss actually co-chaired one of our groups last year, Pathways for Equity. Um, and so the work groups really helped inform the seminal document of the work, the action plan, which is on our website and lays out the action steps we think um, are the priority areas for reform. And then the National Summit was the kickoff event in 2015. Um, so that's on there as well. Here are some of the priority areas. The yellow is hard to see. I apologize about that. Um, these are the areas that the work groups are focusing on, that we're writing on, that the field has said are the priorities for credentialing reform and making sure that all learning counts. Um, as you can see, public policy that advances equity. Common language, making sure that employers, educators, learners are all speaking the same language. Quality assurance, of course. Open and interoperable data and tech infrastructure. Aligning supply and demand. Um, so those are some of the priority areas. I'm going to very briefly talk about the tool in hopes that you will go to the website um, and learn about it more for yourselves. Um, the framework is basically an eight-level reference tool that lists competencies and describes what someone knows and can do. So it has knowledge, specialized skills, personal, and social skills. The difference between our framework and the 21 international frameworks that we researched or some other existing frameworks in the US is that competencies level across, not the credentials. So for example, in Germany, a bachelor's degree is always a level five, and then you read across for the competency statements. Here, you can take learning outcomes, map them against the competency statements in the framework, and get a number. So a credential may be a three, five, seven. Three in knowledge, five in specialized skills, seven in personal skills. And so the framework then gives you a profile score that can help you communicate what the guts of the credential are. So that's essentially a crash course on the beta credentials framework. It's on our website, you can download and I encourage you to play with it. It's being tested right now, uh, as I mentioned. And the next step is to digitize the framework. So we're investigating an algorithm that would live online where profile scores could be stored. Um, and we're also looking at app development, potentially. This is just a snapshot of the framework on our website. Um, you can see level two, you can see all the other levels as well and you can read in each category uh, what the credential indicates someone knows or can do if they hold it. Uh, the goal is laid out here in the vision. So ideally, a better system would look like this. All learning would count, credentials would be portable, transferable, transparent, 
Um, we would be building credentialing pathways, including ramps that, incre that increase access. We know that people come in and out of the system at different points. Um, of course, building a highly competitive and skilled workforce is a primary goal, and we want, it, we want to be agile and relevant. We know that the labor market often changes uh, more quickly than we do. So here, in closing, uh, for my intro are a few ways to get involved. I believe you'll be able to have the slides um, so you don't have to uh, write all these down right now. But website, Twitter, um, Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, you can read about some of our other work as well. So there are lots of ways uh, to get involved. So let's get into the good stuff. Um, as I mentioned, I'm joined by Stephanie Kraus, uh, Director of Special Projects for Jobs for the Future, and Jeremiah, or Jay, Shiflett, uh, Database Administrator, Lord Fairfax Community College and HigherEd.org. So I think I'm going to come over and make it more panel style. And I'd ask that both of you just take five to six minutes, introduce yourself and your work and uh, your thoughts on, on the subject. Sure. Hey, am I working? There we go. I'm, I got a boomy voice and a beard. Steve, so. can you hear in the back? <clears throat> We're all good. Okay. Hey, I'm Jeremiah Shiflett. I'm from Lord Fairfax Community College. Um, at the moment, I'm working as part of a round four Department of Labor TAC grant a project that's called Knowledge to Work. Um, and initially, what we did was take seven programs in high wage, high growth areas um, that the college offered, and we converted them to a direct assessment, competency based education version of those programs. Um, and then part of our, our larger vision was to take that work in identifying national competency frameworks um, that stacked and latticed in other credential areas, um, and then all, present all of the uh, resources that we had mapped to those competencies and put them into this uh, new ecosystem sort of uh, learning, self-directed learning portal uh, that we've put together called HigherEd.org. Um, so just within the, the narrow bandwidth of information technology, we use the American Computing Tool and Machineries uh, competency framework um, for both uh, two certificates, so, well, CSCs, um, the higher ed folks, you know, it's a, it's a big deal, to, the specificity, and I guess we'll get into that more when we talk mm -hmm. about the term alternative credentials and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, HIM, and so we have a, a national partner with the HEMA, American Health Information Management Association. Um, we're actually working to build a new national credential in health informatics to bridge the gap in HIM between you know the the people doing the health information management work and the IT side of it because you have to have very specific knowledge in those areas. Um, so then we have the HEMA framework and we've layered in a number of their credentials um, along with our CSE and our associate and then we also have administrative uh, support technology. Um, we have a search engine repository on higher um, and we say OER, but really it's kind of all sorts of different resources. I mean, we have YouTube videos, we have stuff from Khan Academy, we have traditional courses, we have books on Amazon. So we were, we spent a lot of time, you know, researching the data elements that drive competency-based education. We were members of uh, IMS Global, and we looked uh, at a lot of the work that they were doing and trying to understand, you know, all the moving data points on how to track artifacts relative to competency-based education. And we came to the decision that we needed to present as many different types of resources in as many different learning modes um, so that we could you know, satisfy all these different needs. And, and if you think about it, there's not really a good repository at the moment where you could go and say, hey, I want to go to the Commons and I want to you know, look at Sailor courses and I want to see how all of those things might fit together in different frameworks. So um, you know, as we move our project forward, we're, as the grant wraps up and we start rolling this thing out on our own, we're you know, looking for all sorts of people who are interested in this area to, to come forward with frameworks and, and competency mappings and uh, you know, resources. You know, might be your particular courses that you want to have offered in our plural. And, and then that way we can continue to grow this thing and, and, um, and, and reduce barriers. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. Um, and we like Sailor so much is that you know, we did a, um, some usability testing early on and, and there's just a feeling that people get relative to higher education in general where, you know, some of the words that I remember people saying were, it, it was like filling out the FAFSA. 
you know, going through admissions and in, in, in the college setting is, is a lot of paperwork and it's confusing. And, and that in itself is a barrier. So I like that, you know, Sailor, you can just go and take their courses. You don't necessarily even have to make an account. Um, we, we try to, we, you can use our search engine repository. It's completely open. You don't have to have an account. Um, but we, we narrowed it down to, I think, seven questions um, that, that you need in order to create accounts. So you know, we're trying to just reduce barriers, remove confusion whenever possible uh, to, to enable people to do their own learning. And, and we really see it as, as, a, as a bridge because you know, one of the things that, that people run into a lot in, in thinking about higher education is a commitment factor. And so how, how do you know what you're getting yourself into until you've really got into it and you've started doing some learning? So this is a great way that people can, with zero risk, um, as far as money is concerned, to go and look and see what all the educational you know, milestones are in a, in a career pathway. They can explore and sort of evolve their own understanding. And then when they're ready to go to get a credential, um, they can go to a credential provider or maybe they need more support services and they need to go to a university or institution. You know, and it's all about just leveling the playing field of the mix of all those different things. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Kraus with Jobs for the Future. Um, I promise panels can be hard. I will <laughs> struggle to be brief and engaging, um, if not for you, for me. Uh, I moved on Monday and then <laughs> left my husband, two kids and the dog in a new house and flew to Kansas City yesterday and then here today and I was doing great until I sat on this chair, which is as comfortable as it looks, and uh, sunk down. And so that was our pre-conversation. Mm -hmm. We weren't actually preparing for the panel, but trying to figure out how to um, have a chair heist and, and take these with us. Um, so when I'm not thinking about stealing chairs or being exhausted, I'm uh, the director of special projects for Jobs for the Future, which tells you a lot. Um, it's about as descriptive as my previous title of senior fellow. Um, but as some of you know in this room, I left practice. I was running an education nonprofit in St. Louis um, and had run a competency-based high school in the technical college campus. So like Heather, I come out of the K-12 space and the youth development space um, and left out of this real ethical dilemma that we could get students to complete and get students to be credentialed um, but morally and ethically and practically, we weren't assured of their competence and readiness. And it was no longer okay for me as a practitioner or person, frankly, um, to continue to participate in that kind of system. So I spent the past five years working with a cadre of national organizations, eventually making Jobs for the Future my forever home, but not without a stint working with Katie um, as the campaign director for Connecting <coughs> Credentials, trying to really go after two primary questions. Um, the first being, what does it actually take for someone to be ready for, for the world, for the challenges and opportunities that they may face, for providing for their family and for working and seeking a better life? Um, and then the other part is, what then are the systems and structures and conditions that enable every person to get ready? And so at Jobs for the Future, we are um, embarking in something that we're calling New Horizons, which is really a new vision for the organization, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, in just recognizing and naming that people go in and out of all kinds of settings and systems in their lives, and that we need to blend and blur the lines between working and learning and education and workforce development and youth development. And while we talk about it, um, organizationally, historically, Jobs for the Future and all of the other organizations I've worked for are funded within particular systems. Um, and so we are after, as director of special projects, I get the really um, exciting task of helping to broker and design and develop cross-sector projects. So what that means practically um, is looking at things like, what do we know about the science of learning and student-centered learning, and what does that mean for hiring practices or working with employees? 
How do we take the energy of the Opportunity Youth Movement, uh, rebranded from what we call disconnected youth, which has galvanized new investments and resources, and apply that to efforts to educate and equip uncredentialed adults? Um, what do we do to, to bridge and broker the competency-based ed worlds of K-12 and higher education? Um, so I think I have the best job ever. <laughs> and uh, I get to continue to work with my friends at CSW and other places um, and look forward to talking more. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks uh, for the overview. Um, I have a few questions, of course, but I would say feel free to jump in and ask questions. We're going to make this casual and a discussion as much as possible. Um, but sort of the gorilla in the room is um, the term alternative credentials, I think, for the three of us. So, um, Stephanie, I'm going to kick this one to you first, and then, Jeremiah, I'd love to hear your perspective as well. What does the term alternative credentials mean to you? Is there a better term, and yeah. what's the danger um, with that term? I know this is close to your heart. It is. Um, equity issues definitely are. I think, um, not to hijack the, the panel or the title of the panel, but that we get into a tricky place um, in putting alternative next to credentials. Um, as I mentioned before, going sort of in earnest after this question of what do we need to be ready? Um, the first thing to name and own is that it's more than credentials. There's some kind of combination of competencies and credentials and also connections um, that get us ready. And so if we pull back from credentials as um, sort of this mobility marker, we have to also recognize that there are other things that come up alongside of it. So one of the things that I um, get concerned about when we talk about sub-degrees or alternative credentials is that the power and possibility of smaller forms, newer forms of credentials that are better aligned to workforce needs or where we're headed in the future is that they're nimble and that people truly can be equipped. Um, and they could, in fact, I believe truly, close some persistent inequities. And they also could perpetuate those inequities if they're not um, connected to quality assurances, if they're not connected to employer buy-in and the right kinds of validation, um, if credibility and connections don't come with them. So we can take a poor person in an under-mobilized community where there are too few opportunities for economic advancement and make that person co more competent or give that person an alternative credential and not actually promise the person the kind of economic mobility that he thinks he's getting. Um, and so I, th I think instead, if we look at how the credentialing marketplace is evolving and expanding and how the economy and the, the jobs marketplace is evolving and expanding and how the work that we're doing sits at the confluence um, and how we're sort of in a new time because of the rapid changes, then the question is not what are alternative credentials, but what are the implication of all forms of credentials in this new world, in this new economy, as Heather said. Um, both the emergent ones and the traditional ones and the ones that we don't even know are going to be created. Yep, that's right. Um, and that's one of the things uh, that Stephanie mentioned that we're very conscious of in the, connect the Connecting Credentials Project and that Lumina Foundation is very conscious of this danger that you could unintentionally create a second a system. A second system. Right. Um, so, Jeremiah, you had an interesting perspective on sort of the history. For me, I, I feel like it's uh, more or less um, unintentional sort of classism um, that we sort of unnecessarily present to students in you know, middle school, in most circumstances, certainly in high school, where um, we present this, you know, you have to get a four-year degree. That's the only way that you're going to get your foot in the door. That's the only way that you're going to make it in life. And, you know, it's, it's not that it's not 
good in some circumstances to to head for that achievement. But you know, if you pay attention to you know the presentation before us, or you know, you you look at uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, you realize that there is an, an incredibly growing gap between you know high school and four-year diplomas, where there are you know millions of jobs in the next you know 10 years that are going to be created in that space where people need very specific education um, in order to to do those jobs and to label them with the word alternative I feel like does it a disservice and it just adds to that stigma that already exists um, where you know, trades and, you know, some of those are the best paying middle class jobs that exist that are very stable uh, over time. I mean, we're always going to need electricians and, you know, those kinds of things. And by intentionally saying, you know, hey, you need this four-year degree, you're, you're saying, oh, this is some, you know, cloud and that you're doing a great disservice to these other, you know, there's other, all these other nomenclatures. There's micro-credential, there's, um, um, nano degree, I mean, why does it have to be so diminutive? You know, what is the, I mean, sure, there are, there are subsets of other things, but, you know, it's like, couldn't we say something positive? You know, if you, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, they use this term post-secondary non-degree award. And I think, for me personally, if you just took the word non-degree out of that, you would probably be getting closer to something that I think is more reasonable. Like, you know, it's post-secondary and it's an award. Okay, now we've got something that everybody can start to feel good about. You know, why can't we add positive words to it? We have to be like micro, nano, pico, something. Um, you know, anyway, that's just my personal feeling on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we probably can't come up with a better term than alternative live. Or the best kind of panel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Will you speak right. on alternative credentials? We don't like alternative <laughs> credentials. Right. We like them, but we're not sure about the language, right? Which is what happens a lot. People end up nitpicking the language. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think, th I, think that, I think that's a valuable framing and a discussion that has to be had. Um, so in the marketplace where things are getting smaller and more granular, um, how do learners, students, um, workers assess credential providers, choose what is most suitable for their path and their employment, and how do employers figure out which providers are most valuable, which credentials are most valuable? So um, I, I feel like from the student's perspective that there's three main points that they should pay attention to. Um, the first one is learner control. It, it, it's, you know, can I get the types of resources in the delivery modes that are gonna help me to succeed um, when I need it on, on my schedule, on my terms? I mean, that, that's one of the, the, the first and foremost. The second one is gonna be portability. You know, if I start down this path, but I don't finish it, can I take portions of that somewhere else and does it mean something? And then the final one is, is the verification. You know, is there some sort of cachet around the verifiability of this credential? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think as long as they're paying attention to those three things, that they're going to get steered in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thinking about this question of navigating the credentialing marketplace, uh, I already confess that I moved on Monday. So let me tell you just a quick little um, anecdote here. So my husband and I, two kids and a dog, we're moving and we're moving from a small house to a bigger house. My dad and his wife are also moving. They're moving from a bigger house to a small house. And uh, we both have real estate agents. We sold first. He cannot sell um, his house, which is a bigger family home. There were five of us at home. And, and so I think when we um, consider navigating the space, we have to think about the different generations of learners and workers and their entry points into the marketplace. So for my husband and I, we immediately went online. And the entire experience, including our interactions with the realtor, was via text, online signature, and Zillow. And I even got my data reported to me every day to see how many people were looking at my home and how many had saved it and where, where were we headed. Um, my dad's realtor is a friend who he grew up with and uh, it got posted in the local newspaper, um, which is perfect for my dad 
but not perfect <laughs> for a young family like mine, who I didn't even think about looking in my local newspaper for a new home. Right, so as we consider how um, we coordinate navigating this very complex, often fragmented um, space that people are going in and out of, uh, I think that it makes um, sense for us to think about the various needs for navigating that space. Mm -hmm. If you are an aging adult learner, or if you are a young millennial, or somewhere in between, if you are a first generation student, what are the different needs and um, access points that are already available to you? I really like, and I, I so appreciate that UMUC is in the room, and, and others like Thomas Edison, a lot of our um, folks who are part of the competency-based education network, we see a lot of the CBE institutions, competency-based ed institutions, who are sort of front runners in rethinking navigational supports and student support services and unpacking them a little bit. Um, because I think we're realizing that as the higher education landscape is evolving, we need to, as a professional community, become more adaptable and malleable with that. And as the face of today's college student continues to change, um, we need to mimic that malleability that we've done on the academic end, but now on the student support services end. Mm -hmm. And the discussion that comes up quite a bit in our work groups, in multiple different work groups, aligning supply and demand when we have employers on the call, data and technology infrastructure, what's needed in higher education in order to provide services, there's always the discussion of a mix between yep. technology and still needing the high touch and how yep. that will move along a spectrum yep. depending on the learner. And I should also say, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, I talked earlier about it's some combination of competencies and credentials and connections um, that we can, we can talk about one group over here who can connect into the credentialing marketplace and find a certificate or a badge or a degree or something else pretty easily. And then there's the group that needs more support, but they're in the marketplace. They just don't know what choices to make. They need, they need help. Um, I think we all also know, especially for folks coming out of the OER space, that there is still a very large group almost a third of American adults who don't have a credential and who don't have previous formal post-secondary education. And so the question is not only what's happening in the marketplace and for the folks who are there, but what about all of these people over here who are needing better and more learning and working opportunities who haven't even connected to the marketplace in the first time? Um, and how do we connect with them and get them in there? Mm -hmm. Um, Jeremiah, a question for you um, in your, I think, pretty relevant to your work uh, at the community college. What's your take on extended transcript, e-resumes, portfolios, badges, blockchain, the, you know, those are all sort of hot right now. Is one more promising than another, do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's, the, it's too early to, to tell that yeah. one is doing a lot better than, than another. Um, we, we developed um, an, an extended transcript uh, relative to our direct assessment programs, and in doing so, we, we learned a lot of things. And then, you know, more recently, I was at um, at the IMS Global um, LIA conference in Denver, and I saw UMEC's presentation um, that they did on their extended transcript, and and I was pretty impressed by some of the things that they had done. And I I think, you know, the way that they're the pathway that they're heading, at least in that regard, is very valid um, to to go beyond the competencies and list you know, the connections of the artifacts to those competencies so that, you know, there's this more referential integrity for people to understand how people got there. Um, you know, there was, it was some pretty impressive work. You know, we, we've had our sights set on wanting to be able to push, um, you know, completions and, you know, um, badges and things mm -hmm. out, of, out of our work to some other portfolio system, LinkedIn or whatever, but we just haven't felt um, that the marketplace is exactly in the right mix yet, and we haven't found the right alignment uh, for those types of things. And I think it's a, it's a great direction to head because it helps level that 
the playing field of, you know, hey, I have this degree section, but I don't know if you, if you pay attention to a lot of them, but it's like, here's the section where you list degrees, and then here's the section where we list the other, right? And, and it's like, as long as we keep that sort of mentality or organizational structure about the thing, then I, I'm not sure that they're ever gonna, they're ever gonna be fully seen as, you know, equivalents in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like the, the work that I've seen in um, uh, Pathbright, you know, they have this, nice mix of, of uh, you know, you can put together your own videos and all these sorts of things um, to sort of be more demonstrative about, you know, how you're going to show your skills. It, it really allows people to do creativity, but it kind of, you know, maybe lacks some other things that I see in other areas that are better. So I don't know, you know, the whole thing hasn't um, fully evolved yet, but I mm -hmm. like the way that it's, I like where it's heading. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some interesting things are coming out and, and really I think the ultimate future lies in things like, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the company Tencent who does the massive um, app, mobile app WeChat in China, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they're actually having um, companies that are coming to them because they have such amazing big data, you know, because WeChat is kind of like a combination of Facebook and LinkedIn with PayPal. And so you can get this like sort of richness of data around, you know, people's lives. And so you can see all their interests and where they're going. And, and I think eventually, you know, when we get to this sort of semantic web, you know, big data point, employers will be able to make algorithms to identify people who are the right fit for jobs um, based on their actions and all of the things that they're indicating um, so that they could actually pursue people who are the right fit for that, whether they're looking for that job or not. Mm -hmm. You know, Katie, I may add, um, so I mentioned my move twice, now it's time to mention my mama's status. Um, Poor Katie has been sub subjected to several thousand photos of my two boys over the years. Um, I think as, as a mom, so just the human element here, the idea of portfolios and um, having some sort of digital record that shows what my boys, as they progress through their lives, know and can do and the kinds of experiences that they've had, um, is pretty powerful. And it's matched with the professional knowledge of how unpredictable the future of work seems to be. And I just am losing my, um, uh, I, I, am, I am a cautious mother. And I'm not certain, uh, I don't feel sort of anchored and, and trust that if they carry along credentials from particular institutions, that those will be enough to show what they know and can do. Um, and so when I think about it from that perspective, the e-transcripts as they continue to evolve or allowing my boys to own their learning and be able to have it held by them rather than a particular institution um, is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. I think that's key. And you've both mentioned it, yeah. right? The learner, yeah. worker, student, having control over their own knowledge yeah. and learning. Now the equity piece of me would say, that that will only work if it has substantial buy-in and saturation. Um, so you can, you can do that, but if it's only happening in these more alternative spaces mm -hmm. um, or more distance learning or university college with adult learners, um, and it is not paired with substantial employer buy-in or the buy-in of higher education leaders and others, um, then it won't have the kind of hold and power when they bring in that, that kind of piece. I'm right. hoping my boys are six and four, that it will evolve <laughs> quite substantially by the time they need to use something like this. Yeah, imagine what the technology will look like when they're job hunting. I do not right. want to. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna do one or two more questions and then I'd love to have some questions from the audience uh, for the panel. So speaking of saturation and buy-in, which is the end game, right, employers, are the primary consumers of credentials. So they have to hire based on credentials. They have to know what someone who comes in the door knows and can do for them. Um, do you find that employers are valuing e-transcripts? Are they on board with some of the newer types of credentials? Are students able to communicate them and get hired based on some of the smaller blocks? So I think Katie should answer this. Um, based on the employer engagement work group for connecting credentials and some of the things that yeah. she's heard from employer co-sponsors. 
if you would. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> happy to. And I'd love to hear about any of your employers if they're if they're buying into the e-transcript. So uh, uh, the headline I think is that the progress is slow, right? There, we have some leading large employers plugged into connecting credentials who have started to turn the tide. Um, we have Ernst & Young, a representative from Ernst & Young, um, in our stakeholder group for connecting credentials. And you may have seen a year or two ago now, in the UK, Ernst & Young stopped using a bachelor's degree as a proxy for hiring. Um, and they're now using lists of competencies uh, in the application process, which is a big deal. Um, there are other big employers in the US who are starting to trend that direction as well. Um, but it, it is slow when you sort of step out and you're in front and you have to show how you're using a competency list as opposed to a bachelor's degree, which everyone's more comfortable with. Um, so one other example that I'd mention as, I guess, a lighthouse is Lake Michigan College in Michigan. Um, it works very closely with their employer partners, mostly manufacturing, and a one big hospital system. And employers have asked for a list of 10 things that someone can do in addition to their credential. So the credential matters less when you have the list of competencies and can hire an interview based on that. Um, but you know, we hear all the time still that employers just need to get someone in the door who can show up on time, they can teach them on the job. The credential matters less than sort of the employability skills, the non-technical skills. So I would say that there are leaders emerging, but that it's slow. Um, and you know, we're trying to highlight these examples as much as possible and to show the ROI. Um, you know, you take less time hiring, there's less turnover, you get a clearer picture of what someone can do um, than you might get just because they have a history degree. No offense to anyone who has a history degree <laughs> and political science. <laughs> And the other thing, just to extend, wearing the connecting credentials hat that, that we heard in that space was, um, as many of you may know, that many large employers are using big data to be able to cull through resumes and figure out what candidates um, are eligible for particular jobs, and that there's a legitimate um, technology limitation in the supply and demand signaling. Um, and a real clear need for funders and investors who might be in this room to, to up the investments um, in developing better and more streamlined aligning mm -hmm. technologies that figure out how to unpack what questions do you ask of folks who are uploading their resume to monster.com or to um, some other, you know, or giving it to a firm. How do you begin to unpack those documents um, and put them into a more competency-based hiring mm -hmm. uh, frame? Yep. Yeah, our experience is, has been pretty pretty well received. We you know we go to HR departments of our um, of our um, regional you know employers that we were working with, and and by and large when we show them credential frameworks and we talk to them about that, the HR departments love it. Um, but the problem that they have is that you know a lot of them are smaller businesses and they don't have the money to invest in being able to understand exactly what the competencies are for the particular job roles. Now, I mean, there are a number of professional organizations that are working, you know, I think Ahima is a great example of that in health information management. And I think, I think as things sort of head towards a, that sort of a model, we'll get some change, but I, I don't know that the average HR office is, is ready to start thinking about uh, things in terms of competencies. But, you know, we have this conversation all the time about you know, people come in with, you know, a bachelor's degree from here or there, and they don't understand, you know, an HR office isn't equipped to understand the subtle nuances of this course at this institution right. from this course at mm -hmm. that institution, and, and what, what do those courses even mean anyway? So, it, you know, there's, there's no real way for them to get from that to job skills. So, you know, it, it, they all see it as the, like, oh, wow, it's an aha moment, but they're just, you know, just not quite, mm -hmm. most of them just aren't quite ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. And I know that I keep sort of bludgeoning the point here, but the role of social capital and pedigree cannot be ignored in this. Um, you know, I've sat on the hiring end. I've looked at, oh, he was a Marine Corps member. Oh, she's a Teach for America alum. <laughs> or, oh, God, look where he went to school. He went to Wash U. We do that. We might not name it and own it, but we always do it. Um, we sift and we sort and we connect to the networks that we're connected with. And so as we think again about how are we not only 
uh, getting folks to navigate this space where they might become credentialed in smaller and more piecemeal ways or in newer ways, I, I really, really believe that we have to be much more deliberate and intentional um, in exploring the role of social capital and exploring how we um, equip folks not only with the competencies to obtain a particular degree, but then use that degree for the advancement purposes that it was intended. Um, and that we plan for that in an intentional way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a ton going on. Um, so we've touched on a little bit of it. And I know lots of you are involved in other innovations that are underway. One that I think is interesting to mention um, about social capital specifically, which is sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally left out of the conversation, right? Um, Credly, who's one of our partners, who some of you may be familiar with, is newly working with city and guilds um, and part of what they'll be building into their digital platform is an algorithm that accounts for brand power right. um, which i think is so important because sometimes it's not mentioned but it can't be underestimated we're human we recognize what we recognize um, and history is history and so brands are brands for a reason so i think all sorts of interesting examples of work going on um, and we've you know been a little bit critical, but hopefully thought-provoking. Um, who has questions uh, for the panel? I think we've got a few minutes left. Yep. Um, something that really interests me is uh, boot camps, how they've come up so quickly, um, how employers are hiring a lot of graduates from boot camps. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you guys see um, the traditional higher ed market? How are they trying to compete with that? And um, what are you guys learning, good and bad, from those? So, I mean, I think uh, that there are some extremely successful and effective boot camps. General Assembly is the one mm -hmm. that comes to mind. Um, I would just flag again my pedigree um, and who gets in um, and who does well and who has the prerequisite skills and competencies to financially and practically support a program like that. Um, but the idea of intense training you know, in short periods of time that often is experiential, one of the things that I think is, is a great opportunity of boot camps or these smaller forms of credentials in which what you get at the end of a boot camp I would consider a newer form of credential is um, things that are better aligned to how we learn and live, right? Like fundamentally, on the one hand, folks are looking for efficiency. Is it faster, cheaper? But on the other hand, the, the more optimistic human end um, is, it, is it more like how we learn and live? Um, and so for boot camps, what an incredible opportunity for folks to very quickly, and for some, not all, affordably, upskill um, and advance. And if somebody has brand power, what Katie said, then um, it really can have a huge lift. So General Assembly, to me, is a premier example of someone who has brand power um, and buy-in within their industry and other industries where it functionally acts like what I just mentioned, a Marine Corps or Teach for America or a Peace Corps. There's some level of halo effect there where there's an association of what it means that you went through this particular program um, and what that might say about who you are. Mm -hmm. and I don't feel like it's an either or. I mean, I think there's plenty of room for both um, you know, it's, it's not about, it shouldn't really be about competition, it's about fulfilling the needs and, and having the right alignment, right? I mean, so, you know, maybe the boot camp is what that particular group needs to get to that level, but maybe a traditional course is what this other group needs to get to that particular level. Um, you know, I think there's room in the marketplace for all of those mm -hmm. things because people have such wild varying needs and, as far as delivery modes and skill sets are concerned. So. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we, of course, support the competition. Um, we're not a higher ed institution. <laughs> uh, and there is some competition. Uh, we, you know, some schools in Michigan are le losing enrollees to boot camps, which they can get done in, you know, two weeks, six weeks, eight weeks for much cheaper. Um, so that, that is certainly an issue, that, and that's just the way, you know, it's working in the market right now. Um, there are some neat examples at a couple of colleges in Michigan in healthcare where the wait list to get into an RN program in Grand Rapids is two years. 
Um, and so they've started sending applicants to a boot camp first that gets them through the first, you know, however many credits of the RN program. Then they're able to sort of stagger entry um, and let some in a semester late, a year late, depending on the boot camp they attended. And so that's a really positive model. It works out for the learner, it works out for the institution, they can keep the wait list down, and it just increases efficiency. So I think, yes, there's, you know, certainly there's some competition in the market, but there are great examples of them working together also. And I want to add something on top of that, you know, mm -hmm. relative to the work that they're doing, I think over time you'll start seeing better alignment between things where you know, as you know, different career pathways emerge and there are competency frameworks within those that you'll see these things like boot camps that all sort of stack and lattice into these other things. So, you know, as two-year, four-year institutions become more adaptive to understanding what those things are and how to roll those things into. I know in, in our particular instance, I mean, we, we accept, you know, some of the, creden the credentials from AHIMA that, that roll into your CSC and, you know, in, in coding or your associates in uh, health information management. And, and so, you know, you can start it with a boot camp and then it builds and it builds and it's all about seeing those pathways and the alignments across all of the different choices. And Another question. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sure. Go ahead. And then we'll get one more. Uh, yeah, so you were talking about what I'm, you didn't, I don't know if you used the phrase, but it almost sounds like a, they hear the phrase stackable credential, where there's actually a college credit evaluation that's tied to this uh, smaller unit. And is that something that might be a way to sort of minimize the class problem we were thinking about of two classes of learning, two classes of training, where if I've got my, you know, five classes in web development, but it's worth 15 credits, I could stop there, but then maybe I can go on to Lord Fairfax or wherever. Uh, do we do you see that as, as a potential way to minimize the two-tier system? And also, mm -hmm. is that something that, is, it seems to me that's something that should proliferate. Is that mm -hmm. something you're seeing? Absolutely. I, we advocate for stackable credentials and try to figure out the best way to make it clear what the opportunities are, right? How you can stack different credentials, how you can show what your competencies are. Um, you know, we are looking in depth at all sorts of different groups where this is very pronounced, like immigrants and mm -hmm. refugees. And, you know, I flew, I was an army medic, but I came back and had to start at square one. Um, it, to be an EMT. And so, yes, absolutely, stackable credentials are a great opportunity, I'd say, in short. And I'm sure both of you have mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, I, I think that there's the sort of logical sequencing of stacking up credentials, and then there's those um, sort of mobility markers that I was mentioning mm -hmm. before. So on the one hand, being able to do an array of things that I can afford and access to build toward a career path or or sort of sequential career advancement is terrific when it works. Um, another thing that's interesting is, is coaching and supporting a learner, uh, regardless of age or stage, in a very sort of uh, quick, higher income, you know, get this quick certificate or credential that can get you into a higher paying job that can get you family sustaining wages that gives you the economic stability that later enables you to pursue your career pathway and that's a different kind of stacking that we don't always talk about um, and then I told you about my move I told you about my kids let me tell you about my mother we just moved my mom into town um, and she's aging she's on Social Security she can't actually live on the Social Security payments that she's making um, but she's been a substitute teacher mostly for special education for 15 years and way back when got a graduate degree in counseling But she can't get hired as a teacher Because she doesn't have the degree so she makes less than $80 a day to Function as a teacher which is not a living wage which is hard for her and It's also hard for her adult <laughs> kids who are helping care for her um, There are shorter pathways for career and economic boosting and stability that also need to be looked at. Um, and, and those connect in with things that we have been thinking about for years, things like prior learning and um, you know, being able to assess in some of the, the colleges and places represented here. Um, but I think we still have a ways to go on, on that end. Right. I'm now in the profession, I'm making you some money, and then it might be more likely now that I'm in it, I see you and I like it, and I'm advancing. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go now, I'm going to take my evening classes at UMBC or wherever, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go ahead and get that degree. I just think it's doing it. It's got that uh, opportunity to get that. It's often chicken and egg, right? I 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, bottom line is using credentials as an opportunity to tell our story in what we know and can do in a way that makes sense to the world and helps get us better opportunities is, is what the goal should be. Yeah, and there was a question here. Mm -hmm. It's you. Just, yeah. yeah. I saw your hand a minute ago. I'm kind of intrigued with the language thing. Jeremiah, you mentioned it. You talked about personal branding and sort of creating your story, I think, behind some of the things you said. I mean, I think about, like, uh, competencies. Like, if I'm hiring and you're competent, you're competent, you're competent, you're a rock star. I don't want the competent ones. I want the rock star. <laughs> and so the question is, what do we name things? Like, marketing now in education is really harder than it's ever been. Two-year degree, four-year degree, certificate, graduate degree. Now it's like, what? You know, like, what we got here? And so any comments on how we sell these things as, as universities and how do we appeal both to the employer and to the student and talk about jobs for the future, how do we give them the tools to create their story so they can have a job for the future as opposed to a job for today? Yeah. But I, I amazingly feel your pain. I mean, the, this is the exact situation that we're, we've been in um, in trying to sell the competency-based education direct assessment programs. Um, it's confusing. I mean, higher education is already kind of confusing, and then you add this, oh, we've got this new thing, and it looks like this, and la, 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 and it's just overwhelming. Um, so, you know, the, the work that we've been doing sort of points to th that we have to spend more time working with employers to understand what their needs are, and then we, we either work through them or in concert with them to develop the right things for them. And, and I think that's where the whole, the whole thing, that's the whole, the crux of the, of the entire kit and caboodle. It, it, you know, if you look at the, at the industries that have, that have these credentials, these post-secondary awards that are being super successful, they're spending the time to do research to go into these employers uh, to understand what the competencies are like at the job level so that we, education can be mapped to them, right? Instead of, hey, we're going to educate people over here, and we're going to create jobs over here, and then we're going to try to figure out what the alignment is. You know, it just, it really just doesn't make sense. Uh, and, it, and I would love to tell you that there was some simple answer or, or some great idea that I came across. If, if there was, we'd already be using it. Um, but I think, you know, it, the reality is, is that we're going to have to try to get away from some of this you know, derogatory language in general around, you know, micro, nano, because it, you know, if you don't know much about higher education, when you look at it, you're already thinking, well, this is just some little tiny thing, right? Um, what does that mean, you know? And, and I think we just need, we need to be more cognizant of, of the branding language that we use around these things and try to, to make it simpler and, and maybe not even focus on what the delivery modes are and, and just focus on, hey, this is the job that you're going to get at the end of the, this is what the point of this thing is. This is for this job and, and that's what's going to get you there. So I would add just two very quick things. Um, in one of the early conversations of CBEN, the Competency-Based Education Network, Chris, you may have been a part of this conversation. Um, we had a conversation about, you know, as, as parents or people, like, do you want to be merely competent, right? Like, uh, I want my child to be competent. No, I want him to be a rock star. Um, and and the, the power behind language. Um, so I think it's the difference between what are we setting our systems up, designing systems, and supporting people. So from a human-centered perspective, it is how do I um, recognize and what a person knows and can do and develop that person to his best potential or to pursue the opportunities he wants from a systems perspective. It's how do we enable learners and workers to move on when ready? How do we articulate the skills and attitudes and dispositions that they need to be prepared? Um, bottom line, are they fully prepared to take on a particular role or job at a systems perspective? But, but fundamentally, um, from a human-centered perspective, it's how do, we, how do we let these people thrive? Um, and can we design our learning and working pathways to support that possibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just to put a bow on it, I think um, to answer the question that's in the title of our panel, right, alternative credentials versus degrees, entree, complement, or replacement, we'd probably say all three in some cases. Um,
Thank you for your great questions. I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, you should looking come forward check to the rest the of the chairs. event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Okay.